incredibly historic sandstorms when we're invading Iraq, or you want to drought out or flood out a dictator that you're not happy with, or obscure a beach when there's a landing, or if you just want to make money on the futures market. Owning the weather by 2025, using uh, the weather as a force multiplier. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying before about if you can, if you can control where a weather system goes and how much or how severe the weather system is, then you can do other things uh, like um, it, you may have heard more recently that many of the aircraft that we've been developing are what they call all weather capable, which means that they can fly in any kind of weather, they can shoot and target the enemy under really nasty weather circumstances. Um, and these are all things that you can use to your advantage if you happen to be controlling the weather also because you can have a terrible storm front come in and make it difficult, if not impossible, for the enemy to operate on the ground or to fly their aircraft if they don't have uh, aircraft that are as sophisticated as the ones that you have. And so by creating uh, or using the weather uh, as a force multiplier, as the title implies, that you can achieve an advantage over an enemy force that gives you the upper hand. One of the ideals of the, of the Air Force is to have this all-weather Air Force or to have their pilots uh, coming back safely and using the weather as a salient against the enemy and clearing out their own airports from, say, from ice fogs or from, from bad weather. And so if we could, if, if the idea here is that if we can fly and they can't, that's a great military advantage. Uh, there was also um, research studies on hurricanes that the scientists were truly curious about the behavior of hurricanes, but their military patrons were very interested in how to steer them or direct them in certain ways, almost as a, as a guided weapon. This uh, jet stream that's moving across and it shoots 50 miles north and then 75 miles east and then drops back south again and then kind of goes on its way. And they attributed that little dog leg in the jet stream in Alaska to swinging storm systems out of um, central Texas into uh, central Florida where they deposit a couple of tornadoes in the middle of Orlando that were like really rare to see in that part of the country. And so people remember that event and they remember that situation. But it would be a good example of a very small change in Alaska in terms of a jet stream and what kind of a lower uh, 48 effect uh, that would have. And that's again where weather modification, um, small input in one place can have tremendous uh, change and unexpected outcome in another. You can create uh, weather systems that are so severe they uh, culminate in battlefield denial. Uh, where the enemy is not able to use the roads or the bridges or, or get through the environment because the weather is so severe. Uh, and you can, you can use the weather to destroy his crops, uh, deny him a food source, destabilize his population because people get hungry. When they're hungry, they get angry and nasty and they don't like what's happening. So there are lots of different things that you can do with the materials. It's all how you use them in the environment, how you apply it. One of the biggest concerns of early cloud seeding uh, weather control activities by the General Electric Corporation came from their lawyers who thought that the corporation was totally vulnerable to lawsuits because if they started to make fair or foul weather, the people down below in Massachusetts or downwind of uh, Schenectady could uh, institute massive lawsuits that could put GE out of business. So the, the first response to weather control from their in-house lawyers was to shut it down, was to give it, the project to the military and ask them to do it, with the GE lawyers only being the consultants on the project. So they were allowed to uh, suggest and, and uh, design certain activities, but they weren't allowed to touch anything or throw anything out of the plane. The United States government during the Vietnam War perfected weather modification techniques and also they perfected releasing toxic chemicals like Agent Orange over many areas to defoliate land, trees, grasslands, and other areas. But this is uh, technology that does come up, and it comes up when, when, when you see that the technology advanced far enough to where the practicality of utilizing it in the battlefield environment and the, and the temptation by administrations. I mean, the, the, the best covert war is using the environment itself against your adversary. It was a military moment and it was actually from pretty recent history and this was the US military um, thinking that they might be able to control the the monsoon over Vietnam during that conflict uh, and so only a few a handful of uh, 
top-level military advisors and the president were uh, informed that they were going to try to, to make it rain over the Ho Chi Minh Trail and try to have some military advantage by doing this kind of intervention. When you start talking about manipulating the environment, we have treaties that go back to the mid-70s that forbid this, number one, as weapons of war. So the perfection of weather modification took place, but it became apparent that using weather modification for wartime purposes was not acceptable to the United States government and other nations of the world. So therefore, the NMOD Treaty came into being and was signed by the United States government after passing Congress. The reason it was signed and implemented was because it would ban warfare, weather modification techniques and use during times of war. Almost all of our treaties that we've signed, including the non-proliferation, counter-proliferation treaties, chemical treaties, you know, the ones that were signed recently, last few years, uh, you know, back maybe a decade now, I guess, time goes. But uh, they had domestic exemptions, uh, and so does the environmental treaty, uh, where you can do whatever you want in your own territorial boundaries. When I mean, you start manipulating weather in one part of, a, of the planet, it doesn't look on the ground and say, oh yeah, wait, this is the boundary of a political boundary. It fails to recognize those. So you start to talk about uh, geophysics and manipulating the planet itself. Th then it's a question of those kinds of exemptions shouldn't even be allowed. Meteorology and the military have a very long history, as I said, and it goes uh, into the strategic advantage that multiplies your, your traditional force, that is your, your armament, into uh, using nature to your advantage as well. They want to create a, a storm in the southeast, then they'll start engineering out over the North Pacific. That's where the trailies will be, because you want to work out several days ahead of time so you have less input and you multiply that over a couple of days, you can have a big result in, in five days' time. So small input, upstream, big result, downstream. And one of the rules is always work with what's coming. Don't try to necessarily work against it. You can kill a storm in place. That's easy to do with HARP. You just change the polarization, you change the ionization of the atmosphere, and the storm will fall apart. It will affect the, the setting up of the storm tracks, the jet stream, the location of the storms. And so you end up with a, an intervention on the solar side of things would uh, pretty directly begin to affect the weather patterns. And so climate control or attempted climate control and weather control are, lie on this very large spectrum of intervention. It's also true that if you can forecast climate, you can control a lot of futures markets and you could know if you had the best information or if you had some leverage over what the climate system is going to turn out to be, you would be able to invest in advance in all your crop futures and your agricultural activities and, and not just agriculture but weather effects. I think it's something like 80% of the U.S. economy is weather sensitive and so all kinds of businesses would like to see some weather edge, some uh, ad advantageous uh, information that they would have. It's absolutely entirely possible to profit from uh, uh, the weather. Uh, my name is Michael Agney. I'm an independent trader. Trading commodities at the CME Group, member of the Chicago Board of Trade, and have traded derivatives and futures cash for over 15 years. Uh, weather derivatives are financial instruments that firms would use to hedge risk concerned with uh, adverse weather conditions. The first weather derivative was originally traded by Enron back in 1997. Weather derivatives started in 1999 at the CME Group. Big utilities, reinsurers to hedge against hurricanes or tornadoes or flooding, some, some sort of catastrophe, hedging uh, against a cooler summer or a warmer winter. Let's just say I was insuring a product for $5 million, no matter what it was. Let's say if I was a utility company, a farmer, whatever it was. Let's say I had $5 million worth of crop, but I can do derivatives that are worth double that amount and I can control the, the effects to where I collect on the insurance that's worth 10 million as opposed to selling the crop for 5 million, yes, I could definitely profit from that. 2010, 2011, Southern Illinois, Missouri, those, those you know, we had a high peak of tornadoes and, and those types of adverse weather conditions definitely raised the price of commodities as well as drove the volatility, which also raises the price of commodities. You're gonna make more money if a crop fails. You're creating insurance that's over the price of what your crop is worth, let's say. So if you can control the weather, you control how these products grow.
and if you had an insight to how these products were actually seeded and what products you used to actually grow those items, corn, soybeans, and you can control that market, it's unlimited profit potential if you can control the weather. If you want to send you know, cold into the Midwest, you buy up pipeline capacity, you buy up options on heating and cooling degree days, you buy derivatives off of, off of rainfall. There are mechanisms that you can make hundreds of billions of dollars annually and defray a huge chunk of the cost of this just on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange playing with derivatives in the weather market. Weather derivatives are basically, you're betting that there's going to be a weather disaster and you're betting uh, that it's going to occur within a particular time frame in a particular location and then, you know, the money that you put up basically is like a bet. It's like a wager saying that uh, this, this incident's going to happen here and then when it does happen, there's a big payoff. And that big payoff is something that motivates people to continue to participate in this kind of thing and maybe even feed the very process that's causing the bad weather to happen. Particularly if there's a connection between the people that are seeding the clouds and the people that are making investments. This is a new opportunity. It's a new tool for, for investors. You know, even if uh, someone has no interest in, you know, going on the offensive side and buying things, um, it definitely behooves them to be aware of what's going on out there. The extreme weather is here, you know, and it's not going to reverse itself. The weather event has to be severe. Ionospheric heating, in fact, these instruments, um, when they were first utilized, which is in the former Soviet Union back in the 70s, they, they started out, and they still call these ionospheric heaters because in one mode of operation, you can literally create above this instrument on the ground, you can heat an area 30, up to 30 miles in diameter in the ionosphere. So you heat it up, and by heating it, it literally raises it. So then imagine this column moving up several hundred kilometers out, and then the lower atmosphere begins to rush in and fill that vacant space, that void. And as a result, you're altering pressure systems for you know, quite, a, quite a distance which of course alters the weather. You're also able, if a jet stream is coming in the air, you're able to alter its course. And if you alter a jet stream, even a small amount, then the swing factor on the other end, you can move it. So you're moving storms, say, out of the Midwest, onto the East Coast, or this kind of thing, by just swinging it high in, 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 in terms of its flow and, and getting it redirected. Okay, so now if we look at precipitation, much has been made of this issue of of uh, damage from precipitation. Which the particulates that these trails inter have, uh, have introduced into the sky are, let's just say the storms can develop more violently, more quickly, um, in places that are not necessarily as uh, where you would expect them to be. And so we see more flooding. We see more intense droughts. We see rainfall rates of one to, you know, two and a quarter inches an hour that are just bizarre. And sometimes even rainfall, you know, an inch and a quarter a minute is just unheard of. And so you have an area that's already been heated by the sun's rays, and then you have the aerosol drift in over that area, and it's reflecting both ways. It's reflecting the heat of the sun back out, but it's also trapping the heat that's already been created there by the sunlight. So it will actually create more heat and trap heat inside and closer to the atmosphere. It can actually exacerbate global warming problems. And if you become more aware of what's happening, where the global commodities are, what extreme weather events, you're one step ahead of them. The nature of the risk and our ability to respond to the risk is much greater in the case of um, the scenario that might involve large-scale regional agricultural disruption lasting a number of years. So the agenda was drought. The agenda was to kill the storm, at least in that one particular spot. You see a tremendous and significant loss of property and uh, crop production. Uh, many times this will cause farms to go out of business. And when farmers go out of business, they usually have to sell. And then if there's somebody waiting in the wings to buy their land and then uh, turn that uh, land over to the production of genetically modified crops, you can see where there would be kind of a strategic advantage there. There's something that happened in the Midwest, and I'm sure everybody's heard about the flooding in the Midwest, and what happened is um, George Soros and his big corporate monolith went in and started buying up the farmland. 
So not only is it, is it creating all these stresses, it appears to be a corporate land grab. In other words, when the farmers, the small farmers, go out of business, they're wiped out through these droughts and everything, then the big guys come in, buy up the land. And if you think of Western history, uh, there's a lot of it concerning water rights and even water wars. And so they were shooting about access to uh, uh, water to, to water your livestock. And now people are thinking, or at least the people who are involved in weather control sometimes think about uh, uh, the river of moisture above our heads. And geez, if we could just tap that. But that, that too is a, uh, a, a water right that would involve uh, access to uh, the people that, that, that felt that maybe they had prior uh, rights over it. You're reducing the food security of people through deploying these kinds of approaches that potentially two billion people could have their food disrupted by such interventions. I've been an uh, organic farmer my entire life. And I've been, um, in the last eight years, been certified organic. And so I've been growing food in a way that feels healthy, where I have the most energy. And now it's not so healthy. I want to pass a really nice, healthy soil, rich soil, earth onto the children and have it be fertile. My name is Joel Gil Coca. I've been farming on this land for about five years. Since 2007, and I'm certified organic since, since 2001. 10 years ago, when I started working for myself, we can grow cilantro, no problem. We can grow basil, no problem. We can grow Chinese cabbage without get trouble or any vegetable. But 10 years after, I mean, five years after, that everything started declining. Could you add some of the environment that affect a large population? The answer is absolutely yes. I started seeing chemtrails being laid overhead more frequently and noticing the change in the crop production. What we see in our area Anytime there's convective clouds, anytime there's a large cumulus cloud forming and beginning to rise, when we hear aircraft in the vicinity, we see them actually flying over these convecting clouds, and then in a very short time, before those clouds generally will drop any precipitation, we'll see the entire cloud more or less dissolve into what looks like a massive smoke bank. If you can control the weather, then you can control where the rain falls or where it doesn't fall. And if you can do that, then you can control whose crops survive and whose crops thrive. And if you happen to be favoring um, a corporation or a group of corporations that are uh, flooding the market with genetically modified crops, uh, you can see how manipulating the weather can actually change the, the market share that uh, one or more corporations have. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways that you can do it. You can do it by denying precipitation or by giving too much. You can cause, uh, you know, unusually large hailstones to come out of the sky and completely obliterate a crop of corn. There's lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, you know, a tornadoes rip up an entire town, like Joplin, Missouri, I think it was. If you look back at the tapes of those weather systems, and you look five days prior to that, you'll see that in those days preceding those events, there was all kinds of aerosols being sprayed all along the California coastline where the moisture for those storms came from, where those storm systems originated. You know, it's, I mean, it's insidious when you think about it. Well, Mike, I've seen since the chemtrails have come, there's a direct correlation with the way the health, the food doesn't look as healthy and vibrant and less of it, and that concerns me. And of course, all crop losses are related to weather modification problems. 
either climate, uh, worldwide weather, or local weather, which is called um, microclimates. And these microclimates definitely determine what crop grows where and in which community. And so therefore, without stable microclimates, we cannot produce as much food for the rest of the world and ourselves as when we have a more stable microclimates, not only in the United States, but in other countries as well. We fertilize it really good and they still have a lot of trouble to produce. And I think this is not fun because we're losing a lot of money putting them into this kind of production. In 2008, 2009, three times I lost my complete planting of Chinese cabbage. Weather events is one of the key components to most uh, commodities that are traded. Let's just say uh, your agricultural group, corn, soybeans, wheat, something along those lines. Weather is by far the largest uh, affecting factor in the price of those commodities. If one farmer's crop fails, we have a major crop failure, say in corn, now that's going to affect every other company that uses corn in their manufacturing process, there's going to be less of it. And anytime there's less of something, that creates a price rise. Demand rises, okay, because there isn't any of it. There's only one thing. You've got five people that want it, so they're going to pay more money for it. The companies know that, so they're going to hike the prices up anyway. The consumer actually sees the big brunt end of the higher you know, costs in the commodity due to the adverse weather condition. Obviously, the consumer will pay that price. I've noticed that the rainfall is less predictable, and then when it does rain, it, it does rain periods of time that's more, more like longer periods. So not only do we have the pollution, not only do we have stunted growth, but we also have changes in weather. And it's been severe changes in weather all across the globe. I don't have a clue how bad they are, but I know they are affecting already in, the, in certain plants, you know, like basil, cilantro, and sometimes the broccoli get too much uh, fungus. It, it can be from those things because um, no matter what we do, it doesn't fit. It, it's not working right. It appears to be a fungally related ailment. And if one looks at the species extinction rate, which today, is estimated to be 1,000 times natural variability. That's 1,000 times normal, a figure you'd think would alarm most reasonable people, which is 100,000% of normal. And 70 to 80% of that extinction, plant and animal, is related to fungal infection. Geoengineering particulates are known to proliferate fungal reproduction. Abiotic stresses are drought, cold, heavy metals, excess moisture in the soil. And Monsanto has a patent that actually addresses all of those abiotic stresses. And the plants that it addresses is everything from apples to zucchini. 2011 was one of the worst years for things that create abiotic stress. They had 12 worldwide severe weather problems. This destroyed a good portion of the food supply. Now I'm having a hard time growing cherry tomatoes outside under these conditions and I've turned to having to build a greenhouse where I'm now growing large tomatoes, heirlooms, and they are producing really nice big tomatoes. I see that the tomatoes that I planted now are really healthy and the ones outside are dying. The Midwest grows 40% of the world's corn. And it does have a tendency to flood, so we can expect more and more flooding according to the statistics, the EPA statistics say that there's going to be more and more flooding. Monsanto is one of the world's largest chemical companies. They also own 90% of the seed companies uh, in the world right now, and they are the largest uh, company putting out genetically modified seeds. So what does Monsanto do? Corn is the lead-in because corn is in just about everything. Corn is the main crop, 
and Monsanto leads in with corn products before it does anything else. So what we have is Monsanto leading in with a drought-resistant corn and an abiotic stress-resistant corn. The drought and the flooding, it's all the same patent. Monsanto has a patent for abiotic stress. Abiotic stress is the drought, it's the flooding, it's the excess soil, it's anything that's going to stress a plant. GMO is genetically modified organism and it's also called GE genetic engineering. Well the history of farming has been a farmer will plant a seed into the ground, there will be nutrients in the ground that will enable that plant to grow and then